Hello, I'm Jameson and welcome to the channel. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to talk about the Waco siege and the connection with the Clintons. What we're going to do in this video is take a look at the events that led to the Waco siege and then we're going to examine the videos of the siege itself, figure out why it got so violent and so out of hand so quickly, and then we're going to examine the 51 day standoff, the events that happened during that standoff, and finally we're going to look at the video of the fire and figure out who started the fire that burned the entire compound to the ground. What the Waco siege was, for those of you who don't know, was a 1993 military style raid of a church compound by the ATF. Now what got me interested in this case was looking at the Clinton body count and if you ever do happen to look at that I recommend you have a few hours and a bark bag because it's pretty sick. So this is from the purported fact-checking website Snopes. You'll see below number 44, all former Clinton bodyguards who are dead. And then it says Steve Willis, Robert Williams, Todd McKeon, and Conway LeBlue were alcohol, tobacco, and firearm agents killed during the Waco confrontation on 28th of February 1993. So I didn't find that information by itself strange. I figured, you know, there must have been 15, 20 ATF agents who died. And then I researched it, and it turns out there was only four. All four happened to be Clinton bodyguards. So I decided to research exactly what happened, and that brought me down a pretty deep rabbit hole that uh, I'm now going to bring you on. Enjoy. February 1993. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms storms a large compound in search of illegal guns. It is home to a Christian cult called the Branch Davidians, an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. God speaks to me. The leader is David Koresh, who describes himself as a sinful messiah. Authorities said Koresh was having sex with underage girls in his compound. He also had multiple wives and fathered at least 13 children. So you should be having another one here in about a month, huh? Koresh, who made money selling guns. It's not against law. To, to buy anything that they sell at a gun show. Was not about to surrender peacefully when his home was raided, and along with his followers, took up arms against the authorities. Four ATF agents were killed, at least 15 were wounded. The federal agents retreated. It was now a very tense standoff. FBI negotiators trying unsuccessfully to get Koresh and his followers to surrender. On April 19, 1993, patients had finally run out. With specially modified tanks and grenade-like canisters, federal agents launched a tear gas attack to force the Davidians out. What happened next was a total disaster. Flames engulfed the compound, killing nearly everyone, including Koresh. 76 Branch Davidians dead, 24 of them children. So, there you go. That's what happened. Straight from the uh, Abe Lincoln of Nooses, CNN. They've never told the lie. So, see you guys next time. Just kidding. So, if you want to know what really happened, you have to start in 1987 with a guy named Mark Bro. This is a guy that the ATF used primarily to get the affidavit to raid the compound, and we'll get into all of that later. But first, let's get a little background on Mark Bro. Around 1987, Mark Bro a self-proclaimed prophet from Honolulu, Hawaii, joined the Branch Davidians at Mount Carmel. He was asked to leave in 1989 when he tried to take over the leadership of the Mount Carmel Center from David Koresh. Mark Bro vowed revenge. He called several international agencies and made allegations against David Koresh of adulterous sex, child abuse, and gun stockpiling. So, Mark Bro went around making some really outrageous statements and whether they were true we're going to examine in a moment but first we're going to take a look at the search warrant because the search warrant was provided mainly on information by Mark Bro. So the ATF agent who obtained the search warrant was Davy Aguilera. Aguilera writes, I believe Vernon Howell aka David Koresh and or his followers who reside at the compound known locally as Mount Carmel Center are unlawfully manufacturing and possessing machine guns and explosive devices. So there you have it. So the ATF obtained a search warrant because they thought the compound had illegal weapons and explosives and that's how this whole thing began. But the question now becomes 
how did they get that information? And that's what we'll look at right here. So what we're going to look at is the House investigation into the activities of the federal law enforcement agencies towards the Branch Davidians. So this is at the very beginning of the report. One of the first things they list, they say, Former Davidian Mark Brielt provided much of the information contained in the ATF's affidavit. Yet nowhere in the affidavit is it mentioned that Brielt left the compound as an opponent of Koresh, a fact certain to call into question Brielt's motives. Nor does the affidavit mention that he is blind. On the contrary, the affidavit implies he was a compound bodyguard. So yes, you read and heard that correctly. Mark Briel, who was essentially the only piece of evidence presented by the ATF to get this search warrant of a church compound, was blind. What Mark Briel told the ATF is that he was a bodyguard for the compound and that he would go with David Koresh on weapons deals and he saw him purchase and sell automatic weapons, explosives, grenades, things like that. I have a little tip for the ATF. If you're going to do a military raid on a church, don't have the only piece of evidence be the eyewitness testimony of a blind man. Why did you do that? Anyway, the report has quite a few other issues. On July 30th, Aguilera joined ATF Compliance Officer Jimmy Ray Skinner to conduct a compliance inspection on the premises of Henry McMahon proprietor of Hewitt Handguns. The inspection revealed that certain AR-15 lower receivers supposedly in McMahon's inventory were neither on the premises nor in his records as sold. McMahon indicated that they were in possession of David Koresh. McMahon then called Koresh, who offered to allow the agents to inspect for possible firearm violations. The agents declined the invitation. It continues, it is unclear why the ATF did not accept the offer to do a compliance inspection of Koresh's firearms. Importantly, the Treasury report fails to mention that Aguilera had an opportunity at the time of the compliance inspection to inspect Koresh's firearms. What this means is that the ATF had an opportunity to go into the house voluntarily and search for weapons. And instead, they decided to get a search warrant and raid people's homes. It's pretty bizarre. A lot of you who saw that video at the beginning probably are wondering, hey, I thought it was illegal for the federal government to use tanks and things of that nature against civilians. And what you're referring to is the Posse Comitatus Act. So the purpose of the act is to limit the power of the federal government in using federal military personnel to enforce domestic policies within the United States it goes on to say the act does not prevent the Army National Guard or Air National Guard under state authority from acting in law enforcement capacity with its home state or an adjacent state if invited by the state's governor. So the governor of Texas at the time was Ann Richards and from this Austin Chronicle article you'll see it says well she was governor Richards approved the request that allowed federal agents to use three National Guards helicopters during its February 28, 1993 assault on the Waco compound. You'll see one of the helicopters right there, and then you'll see the other one right below it. The article continues, the use of three military helicopters, and then it lists them, was justified by the government's special claim that there was a methamphetamine lab inside Mount Carmel. The allegation allowed the ATF to ask Richard for permission to use the helicopters. So here's one of the helicopters, you'll see there's a gun right there, a military equipped gun. You'll notice at the back of the plane it's labeled US Army rather than National Guard and here's that same chopper on the day of the raid and here's all three of them together on that same day. To answer everyone's question, the reason why they were able to use military personnel and military equipment is because there was a suspected meth lab inside the compound. Now, obviously we have to dive into where did they get the information that there was a meth lab? It couldn't have been Mark Brielt again. No chance. So this is from that same House report. Three days after their meeting with ATF, 
The Texas counterdrug representatives received a fast mail of a letter dated December 14, 1992 on Houston SAC letterhead from the RAC of the Austin ATF office, Earl K. Dunnigan, requesting military assistance from the Texas counterdrug program. It continues, although the request did not mention suspected drug violations, as would be required to secure non-reimbursable assistance or military assistance from a counter-drug unit, Lieutenant Colonel Petit initialed his approval on the request. These officers applied for and received military assistance, even though they needed a drug nexus. But do not fear. Mark Brielt is here. Two days after Lieutenant Colonel Petit's approval, Special Agent Aguilera informed Lieutenant Colonel Walker on December 16, 1992, that he had received a FASA mail from Mark Briel in Australia suggesting the existence of a methamphetamine lab at the Branch Davidian residence. The subcommittees conclude that the ATF intentionally misled Defense Department and military personnel as to whether the Davidians were operating in a legal drug manufacturing operation at the Davidian residence. The subcommittee also concludes that the commander of the military personnel providing the training knew or should have known that the ATF's allegations as to the existence of a drug manufacturing operation at the Davidian residence were at best overstated and were probably untrue. Essentially, the ATF posed to the Defense Department that this was a crystal meth lab, so we need your help. After the raid happened, when they investigated it, they determined they lied. They lied, and that there was ample evidence that there was no crystal meth manufacturing going on there. But nonetheless, the raid took place, and they had the military backing them up. But, unfortunately, the absurdity of the actions of the ATF before the raid took place continues. The ATF agents posed as students attending classes at a local technical college to monitor the activities of the Davidians. How do you do, fellow kids? What? I couldn't resist not adding that in. Any time I hear about cops posing as students, I just picture some creepy 40-year-old dude hitting on college students all day. But let's just take a look at the ATF's undercover work and see what they came up with. So this is an ATF report on their undercover activities. It says, on February 19th, 1993, four days before the raid, mind you, Special Agent Robert Rodriguez and Jeffrey Brzezowski in an undercover capacity went to the Davidian compound and met with leader David Koresh and two other male members for the purpose of shooting AR-15 rifles. It then goes on, before the shooting started, David Koresh went back inside the compound and brought some 223 caliber rounds for the agents to shoot. Special Agents Rodriguez and Brzezowski, along with David Koresh, shot the AR-15 rifles. David Koresh displayed an ability to shoot the rifles very well. After shooting the rifles, Special Agent Rodriguez allowed David Koresh and two males to shoot Rodriguez's 38 caliber super pistol. So the ATF portrayed... David Koresh to both the media and the Department of Defense as such a menace to society that they had to carry out a military raid on his compound. Meanwhile, four days before that raid is happening, they have agents there shooting AR-15s and their own pistols with him at the compound. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, before we get into the actual breakdown of the raid, what I wanted to touch on was David Koresh his actual mental state. In the media, he's portrayed as somebody with a messiah complex, a gun-toting lunatic. So, let's examine some of the videos that the media portrayed. This one is one of the main ones that they played over and over and over again on the news when the raid was carried out. You better watch out. <laughs> I'm God. Now, that clip by itself sounds pretty menacing, and it is. It sounds like he's a crazy person. However, that was a response to a question by a reporter about a man named George Rodin and an accusation he made against David Koresh. Now, the first thing we have to do is see who George Rodin is. So, George Rodin was the previous leader of the Branch Davidians, and in 1987, he was evicted from the Mount Carmel Center near Waco, Texas by his rival David Koresh. 
He was later confined in a Texas mental hospital for a 1989 murder until his own death. So once George Roden was evicted from the Mount Carmel Center, he accused David Koresh of raping and impregnating his 75-year-old mother. And the media took these claims seriously, despite the fact that he ended up in a mental institution for butchering his roommate with an axe. If he raped my mother... So the only reason why I showed that is so you could see that the accusation is legitimate and that is what he was talking about, but let's take a look at the full clip. If I took a 70-year-old woman and got her pregnant, you better watch out. I'm God. So when you actually see the full clip and the context of it, it's not menacing at all. Now what Koresh was doing here was referencing a biblical figure, Sarah. So Sarah was childless until she was 90 years old. God promised Abraham she would be a mother of nations and that she would conceive and bear a son. And essentially, God impregnated her when she was 90 years old. And that's what he was talking about. The next thing I want to do is just briefly touch on his stance on guns because he was really portrayed as a gun-toting maniac. And I'll let his words speak for him about his stance on guns. You have guns? Yeah, we have some. Well, can we see that? Is that okay? Well, I guess if you want. <laughs> you know. Now, it makes nobody's business whether we have a gun or not at this place. Guns are the right of Americans to have. You know, it's bringing up guns in, in, in a situation like this is something that can be, you know how people think. So that was his stance on guns. And the next thing we're going to briefly touch on is just the accusations of polygamy. And this is a clip from that same Australian interview. He'd had sex with most of the women in this sermon, sitting happily with their husbands. No time like the present. People say you've been sleeping with the women here. Is that true? No, only one. And she's tired of it. Now, I mean, she's tired of the accusations. So in terms of the polygamy accusations, David Koresh always denied it. He always said he had one wife and three kids with that same wife. That's his words, and it's never been proven otherwise. It's only been accusations. The next thing we'll touch on, though, is the accusations of child abuse and child rape. We also put to Koresh claims that he had sex with children and underage girls. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. So essentially, all the outlandish claims made against him, he denied. And they were never proven, even in a court of law or outside. And in America, you're innocent until proven guilty. So as of the day he died, he was innocent of all of that. It was just media speculation based on accusations of people who at one time were around him. All right, so now we're going to get to the gunfight. How a simple search warrant developed into a gunfight that ended in a 51-day siege with the entire compound burning and everyone inside of it dying except for eight people, most of which who were burned alive. So we're going to look at the Treasury investigation into this to see how it started. They had a meeting, the ATF, and the tactical planners had reached a consensus that the plan should be formulated for a dynamic entry. Now, what that means is they were going to make three entry points into the house. One marked by the arrow in the front, one marked by an X on the side, and then one with the other X in the back. The reason why the carrying out of this search warrant got so violent essentially boils down to the first one to two minutes of the raid. So, according to Koresh, he just went to the door and... They started firing at me. And so what happened was is that I fell back in the door and the bullet started coming through the door. According to Koresh, he just came to the door and they just started firing. The ATF obviously has a different story. So according to the House report, the agents identified themselves, stated they had a warrant, and yelled, freeze and get down. But Koresh slammed the door before the agents could reach it. Gunfire from inside the compound burst through the door. The force of the gunfire was so great that the door bowed outward. It continues, then gunfire erupted from virtually every window in front of the compound. Since both parties involved are saying complete opposite things, what we're going to do is we're going to break down the footage 
and the photos from that day to figure out who's telling the truth. Here's a picture within the first 30 seconds of the raid and you can see the doors are not bowed in and none of the glass is broken. There's nobody standing in any of the windows firing at the agents. If you zoom in on this picture, you see three agents standing right in front of the door, not covered at all. But you can see bullet holes throughout the door and around it. You know, logic would make you think if you were being fired upon, you would run for cover rather than just standing there. So it seems at this point that the bullets are only coming in one direction. Now, this is a video taken of the initial encounter. Now, we're going to watch that again, but uh, what I want you to look at is the area in and around the ATF. There's an automatic weapon being fired, and you can see it at the end of the video. It's coming from an ATF agent, and they claim that they're being fired upon by automatic weapons coming from the house, but none of their glass is breaking. You don't see any dirt kicking up around them, and you hear one automatic weapon, and you see it being fired. If you're wondering why these clips are so short and they seem heavily edited, it's because they are. They're ATF clips that they release to the media of the initial raid. So you pretty much have to analyze it and figure out what's going on for yourself or just trust what they're saying is fact. Another chopper with more people and more guns going off. Here they come. All right. Wayne, cut. More firing. I that's not us, that's them. Okay, that, all right. What that was was a clip of somebody from inside the compound who called 911 to report that they were being fired upon and were not firing back. So what we're going to look at next is the raid happening on the side of the house, which is going on simultaneously as a clip you previously just saw in the front of the house. We're going to watch that clip again because it's important. One of the agents just shot himself in the leg. And also keep in mind, they're climbing up a ladder in front of windows and nobody is firing on them. Watch the agent in the bottom right of your screen climbing up the ladder. So he reaches for his gun, which when ATFs are doing raids, they do not have safeties on them. He reaches for it, it goes off, and he falls slightly down the ladder. The House report states in the face of insurmountable, unrelenting automatic and semi-automatic weapons fire from virtually every area of the compound, the agents had no choice but to remain in their covered positions. The openness of the terrain made retreat impossible. The Department of Justice report says as the agents exited the trailers, gunfire erupted from the compound and cult members threw homemade hand grenades at the agents. And you'll see this trailer in a moment. And... Look to see if it looks like they've been grenaded and shot at with automatic weapons. Now, the reason why this is important is you see this agent being carried off right here. And this picture was taken by the Dallas Morning News. Now, ask yourself a question. If there was bullets flying out of this house, do you think that they would allow reporters still to be taking pictures? You can see there's bullets all over the windows, everywhere. Yet, yeah, take a look in the bottom right. So that green thing is a tarp that is over a cattle car that was used to carry in the ATF agents, 35 of them. There was two cattle cars, 35 in each, 36 actually. There were 72 agents. Notice the cattle car, which is just a tarp, has no bullet holes. That pickup truck right there has no bullet holes, yet the whole house is riddled with bullets everywhere. So we're now going to take a look back at the Treasury report on this incident, and this is where the Clinton connection comes in. So you'll see the New Orleans SRT would be responsible for gaining control of the arms room and Koresh's bedroom. You'll see from the ATF report, Conway LeBlu, Todd McKean, and Robert Williams, all who were murdered in this incident, were part of the New Orleans team. So Koresh's bedroom is circled here in black, and that is why the ATF had units going up those ladders was to gain entry into that bedroom which was the New Orleans team. Now we'll watch the New Orleans team breach the house through David Koresh's window. Go back 
Probably give me another take then. We're going to watch that again, but one thing I want you to notice is that the ATF says soon after the agents reached the roof, they came under heavy gunfire. And let's see if it looks like they are. So I've turned off the sound so you can hear me talk, but any editing you see is from the ATF before they released it to the media. So the agents are uh, already breached the window. They're breaking the frame now, and you'll see the agent on the bottom right is getting a smoke grenade ready. He has it in his left hand and he's about to toss it in. You'll see the smoke coming from the grenade once he launches it right there. You see the smoke coming out of the window and notice there's no gunfire at all coming from within the compound at these agents, even as they're slowly going into the window. Once the third agent enters, you'll see a cut by our friends at the ATF. I paused it here because you can see the agent about to throw something into the room. And then he takes his gun, he points and fires twice, and immediately the bullets start coming out. He then takes his gun, fires several more times, and then the bullets become overwhelming and he ducks for cover. So if you look again, he throws in what is a grenade. Why would you throw in a grenade right after three of your fellow ATF agents just entered the room? It makes no sense unless you were trying to kill them. And then he looks in and fires blindly into the room. So as he's ducking for cover, if this was the Branch Davidian shooting at him, why wouldn't they just walk over to the window, reach out, and shoot him? It doesn't make any sense unless somebody was incapacitated by a grenade. Same thing with going down the ladder. He could, they could have just gone out of a window on the bottom floor and shot him. We're going to watch this one more time because you can see the bullets are done. So everyone inside the room firing is dead at this point. I wonder if the U.S. Army chopper hovering above had anything to do with that. That would, of course, had to have been authorized by the commander-in-chief at the time. Another curious thing, if you look at the four men who died, you'll see on the far right, hospital where treated. All four of them are N.A. with a star. Now, what that means is that they were either treated by EMT at the scene or by a private physician. Now, all four of these men were very severely injured, so obviously they saw a doctor. And it's very strange that you would have these men see a private physician instead of taking them to a hospital. Now, am I accusing the Clintons of setting up this whole raid just to kill four ATF agents who knew too much when they were Clinton's bodyguards? No, I don't want to end up on that list. It's not like Bill Clinton was going through any scandals while these four men who died were his bodyguards in the 1992 presidential campaign and prior to that as Arkansas governor. It's also absurd to think that the Clintons would be involved in murdering somebody just for being able to expose potential political scandals. The Clintons are in politics for one reason and one reason only, and that's to help the American people. It has nothing to do with money or power or eliminating those who potentially could destroy that money and power. <laughs> but legitimately, I am not accusing them of carrying out this whole raid to kill those agents. I do think it's possible and deserves more investigation, but it won't. A lot of it has to do with the evidence being destroyed by the fire. So that was essentially all the videos and all the images that I could find leading up to the raid and the actual raid itself. I think it is evident if you look at the videos and the pictures that the ATF was firing for quite a while before they were fired upon at all. After that initial raid, there was a ceasefire that lasted 51 days. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the 51 days and the events that happened. And now keep in mind, all this information is from the ATF the Judicial Department report and the House report. The phone lines of the Branch Davidians were cut off. A lot of their electricity was. The media was moved three miles away from the compound. Citizens five miles from the compound. So pretty much the only thing we know that happened is from what the government tells us happened. So the first few days of the raid were uneventful and the Davidians refused to come out. What they did was they cited Texas Penal Code 9.31 self-defense Specifically, Section 3, which says the use of force to resist an arrest or search is justified before the actor offers any resistance, the peace officer uses or attempts to use greater force than necessary to make a arrest or search. Were they correct in that? I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but that is why they refused to come out of the house. 
So at this point in the raid, the FBI took over most of the negotiations from the ATF, and then on March 14, 1993, the FBI focused bright lights on the residents in an effort to disrupt the sleep of those inside. They were not happy that nobody was coming outside, so they were going to try to resort to psychological torture in order to get them to come out. And then another thing they did, the FBI began playing recordings of Tibetan chants, rabbits being slaughtered, and other sound effects. The House report specifically states that negotiations were stalled because the Davidians were unable to sleep with sounds of loud music and rabbits being slaughtered. Keep in mind that there were 24 children in the house being subjected to this, and this is what they were experiencing every single night. Media just thought this was hilarious. This is from Entertainment Weekly writer Brian Jacobs Meyer. The playlist of the Waco Siege is electric. Tibetan chants, bugle calls, Christmas carols, Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Are Made for Walking. Wow, children being psychologically tortured. How electric. The reason why I included this clown's article is because it includes a song that was played over and over and over again. Nancy Sinatra's These Boots Are Made for Walking. You'll see from the lyrics it says, You keep playing where you shouldn't be playing, and you keep thinking that you'll never get burned. Ha! I just found me a brand new box of matches. Yeah. Very ominous. We'll continue on with looking at the uh, Department of Justice report on Waco. On March 26th, the negotiator told Schneider that 10 people must come out by noon. As the deadline approached, Schneider reported to the negotiator that he had talked to people but no one wanted to come out, and the FBI was not happy. The response, in response, the FBI cleared vehicles and trees from around the compound. And by cleared vehicles, they mean they smashed their cars with a tank. So after smashing every car outside, including the children's power wheels, the negotiators told Snyder that no one would be allowed to come outside the compound. Several individuals came out of the compound and into the courtyard several times over the next few days and were flashbanged by the FBI. So over those 51 days, both sides were totally irrational. There was almost no negotiations that went well. Uh, but the bottom line is only one side had psychological torture for weeks on end lack of sleep, their possessions crushed, and grenades thrown at them when they tried to leave their home. But we're now going to get into the actual fire, who started the fire, but there's a few important things you need to know before we actually look at the video of the fire being started. So you'll see in this article from the Dallas Morning News, the Branch Davidian compound was ringed with FBI closed circuit cameras and secret government sensing devices during the entire 1993 standoff and the cameras were used throughout April 19th, the day the federal agents launched a tank and tear gas attack. So this is from Cox News, FBI used bugs to keep an eye, ear on cultists. The FBI spied on the Branch Davidian sect during the 51-day siege at Waco with an array of sophisticated gadgets, including eavesdropping devices that were slipped into the compound with supplies. And finally, this is from the House report. Forward-looking infrared radar was used by the government and cameras aboard helicopters and planes flying over the Branch Davidian compound on the day of the final assault. So the reason why all of this is important is because the FBI and the ATF knew where everyone was in the compound. They knew what they were saying, they knew what they were doing, and they knew the exact location. So here's the layout of the Branch Davidian compound. You'll see the bunker on the bottom of the screen, and then you'll see it has one entrance and one exit, the trap door circled. You'll see in this article from the Waco Tribune Herald, Bunker Last Refuge for Most and Cult Last Remnant of Compound has yielded more than half the bodies found. So the first thing you want to look at is the tank over the tunnel to the bunker. You can see that there's two large holes right over where the entrance to the trap door to the bunker is and that the house has already been knocked off of its foundation. The underground bunker is in front of the water tower shown here before 6 a.m.
This tank was over the tunnel to the underground bunker. For more than two hours, a tank is over the underground bunker or at the hole in the corner of the house at the entrance to the tunnel. I wanted to stop it right here really quickly and show you something. You can see fire coming from the tank right here. You see the bottom right of the tank. There's clearly fire shooting from the tank. Each time the tank opens, agents can be seen getting in or out, and the camera filming it conveniently cuts away. At approximately 6.10 a.m., smoke begins pouring from the underground bunker. None of the media mentions the fire in the underground bunker, yet this is when and where the first fire began and where many people lost their lives. This is the first tank that goes into the compound that actually does damage. It's supposedly poking small holes in the wall so they can insert CS gas, but does that look like small holes to you? No, what they're doing, and you see it here, is they're knocking out the stairwells so that people on the second floor can't escape. And here, we'll pause it, you'll see that they're destroying the house by the trap door, so whether it was intentional or not, I don't know, but nobody can escape. So you'll see this article from the Waco Tribune. Other testimony on Friday revealed the trap door leading to the compound's underground bus was blocked by debris caused by FBI tanks that stormed the compound. Keep in mind, with all their spy equipment and infrared gear, the FBI knew that most of the people and all the children were in the bunker. You'll see this tank is knocking down the final stairwell and watch what happens when it pulls back right here. You'll see that flames are clearly, clearly coming out of the front of the tank. Watch that again in real time and you see the flames coming out. Preposterous to say they didn't start the fire. Next, that same tank goes into the house, knocks out a wall and you can see what looks like a body comes out with it. And then he goes back in, tries to shake it off, brings it back out again. Here it comes, and you'll see, yep, that same body is on there, and then the tank goes back in, but you can see that body and the piece of wood are on fire. We're going to watch that again. So you'll see the tank comes out with what looks like a body, and then it goes back in. We're going to skip forward and slow it down. So the tank swings what appears to be the body out. And you can see right here, we're going to freeze it. It looks like it's on fire. It almost certainly looks like. Even when it goes back in, you can see the shades of fire off of it. And then the uh, tank will move on to destroying another part of the house. So from that footage, it looks an awful lot like the FBI intentionally started the fire. But let's take a look at the news footage from that day. We're going to look at a CNN clip and notice how in this clip the left side of the house where the bunker is that is already on fire is cut off from the picture. to check out the yes yes let's do it let's do it You're about to see that previous tank that we saw on fire emerge from the side of the building. There it is. Well, uh, Bonnie, for the last 15 minutes, we've watched this M60 vehicle, this uh, combat engineering vehicle, uh, make large holes in the side of this building and pump uh, tear gas in there. Uh, and. Uh, at times, as you well know, tear gas can be incendiary, and apparently this is what's happened. Um, and it looks like now we have a very large-scale fire breaking out on what must be the south side, right near the front side of this building. Uh, this, these are some amazing pictures here. Uh, a fire has broken out, and uh, let's just stay with this and watch it for a few minutes if we can. As I said, the um, this, this uh, combat engineering vehicle has been working very diligently around the front door of the complex then he'd turn around with a turret and pump tear gas in and uh, 
So, as you can hear from that reporter, they claim that they were pumping tear gas in, which is highly flammable. So let's just talk about that for a second and why that's okay. So CS gas is the defining component of tear gas. The use of CS in war is prohibited under the terms of the Chemical Weapons Convention signed by most nations in 1993. That was right around, it was actually right after this, but it wouldn't have mattered because it was a raid of a home, not a military conflict. So the uh, Wikipedia page of CS gas specifically mentions the Waco siege. A study done by Uwe Heinrich says, no human deaths had been reported, but concluded that the lethality of the CS used would have been determined mainly by two factors, whether gas masks were used and whether the occupants were trapped in a room, like a bunker for instance. He suggests that if no gas masks were used, which they weren't, and the occupants were trapped, which they were, then there's a distinct possibility that this kind of CS exposure can significantly contribute or even cause lethal effects. So let's just say that the government did not intentionally set the compound on fire with tanks, which is what it looks like they did. Let's just say they just injected CS gas. Why is it okay for the government to use CS gas on civilians? They use it to this day. It can be lethal, especially in enclosed areas, and it's highly flammable. So even if they didn't light the fire, they put in CS gas into a confined area. All they had to do was trip an electrical wire knock over a lamp, hit a light, which I'm sure they did, and a fire would erupt, which it did. After most of the compound was burned down, the FBI and ATF used the liberty of their tanks to push what remained of it into the fire, as you'll see here. So this is a crime scene, and they are literally going around with tanks, destroying evidence. Why would they do that? So that, in a nutshell, is what happened at the Waco siege, and in my opinion, it's probably the worst things ever carried out on American citizens by our own government. The entire premise of the search warrant was based on the eyewitness testimony of one blind man. The ATF lied on the reports about whether they had a crystal meth lab which allowed them to get military help. In addition, from the actual raid, from all indications, video footage, photographs, it looks like the ATF fired upon the compound for several minutes before any shots were fired back. And then the people inside the compound were subjected to weeks of psychological torture, many of which who were inside were children. And to top it all off, the entire compound was burned down by the FBI and ATF. It's just really, really sick. And the sad thing is nobody's going to be held responsible. In my career with ATF, the people that I put in jail have more honor than the top administration in this organization. I know it's a sad commentary, but that's my experience with ATF. Well, thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe, share, comment, and I'll see you next time.